Welcome to the Ronyo and Duran podcast show. I'm Ronyo. I'm Duran. In today's special edition, we're going to examine why you need to ensure that your protections are designed for specific clients. All too often when people create applications or software in general, particularly with this massive push toward APIs and things of that nature, we forget that from a content delivery and security perspective, we have to ensure that our application takes into account the client or clients that will be utilizing the software. In today's example, we're going to look a little further at some of the issues that we've already presented, but look at them from a different concept. Instead, we're going to be examining them not from the exploitation and illustration of the vulnerability perspective, but rather we're going to be looking at it from the perspective of how to protect against it and how those different protections will vary client by client and why we have to specifically determine and address what clients we are going to support and what clients we aren't, and then how we have to integrate our expectations with that of the users. So looking at our first example, we're going to be taking a quick peek at some protections that will help to thwart things like CSV injection, especially CSV injection tied to attacking our clients. So you might remember, but in our last demonstration, we showed CSV injection and then we showed real quickly and talked a little bit about how you can create special attacks that are designed to hit Microsoft Excel and similar spreadsheet applications, be they, of course, LibreOffice or some other software. We didn't go through and discuss how an attacker may, for example, utilize that in order to do command injection. One of the important things with regard to something like Excel in particular is you can actually create special input, something akin to equals, and now we type in command. Now this would execute our given command and we're going to pipe it in. And then we would put in a cmda.exe that opens up the command line terminal for Microsoft. And maybe you would do something like this and we do a one, something similar to this as your attack. Now, LibreOffice, of course, doesn't understand this particular attack. However, other systems do. But there's an easy way to take care of this, assuming you, of course, have made the decision that the client, in this case, is going to be Excel or some other spreadsheet like software and my recommendation would be to actually be specific so you would say something like microsoft excel and it's version 16 or 19 or whatever it happens to be but pick a major version and there are a few reasons for that and it's going to come down to when we look at csv out or if we look at the given csv as the case may be we're going to see the same general thing in both of these cases, the software is failing to account for and provide the escaping necessary for the spreadsheet client. This is akin to if we were trying to prevent cross-site scripting or some other client-side attack, and in the case of cross-site scripting, we escaped the HTML characters and if it's being injected into some uh, script tag or something like that, maybe it's even something like an, an on mouse over or what have you, we would instead in those cases be escaping or encoding as the case may be, any character that is JavaScripty. Same exact concept, it's just here we're doing it for Excel. So the first thing we have to do is understand that every client is going to be different. In the case of most of the spreadsheet software, however, if I put a single quote in front of the equal sign, it will no longer operate as a function. And what that means is for me, 
I'm going to go through and actually, I will create a new private static variable. And this one is actually going to be a pattern. And we're going to call it formula text. So, or actually we'll say formula start. Okay. Pattern.compile. This of course is just the Java way of doing it. At a later date, we'll show this in other languages as well, just over the course of time. But you should be able to take these concepts and port them over to arbitrary languages. So now we have to create the actual regular expression. So the important thing for our client is if the string, if that cell starts with an equal sign, then it assumes that it is in fact a formula. But it goes a little further than that. If you actually look into it, they allow a few other characters. They allow, for example, the minus plus and the at sign. Now, real quickly, just to let you know, we have to escape the minus or if we put it at the end, we wouldn't need to escape it. The reason why we have to escape it, of course, is because this is a special character at least in this particular placement, this would be something like A to Z, one, two, three, zero, two, nine. So the hyphen means from the left to the right. And that makes no sense from the perspective of equals to plus. That's utterly meaningless. We could use ASCII or hex code or something like that instead to represent each one of these symbols but there's really no point and that makes the regular expression less readable anyway and we're all about something being readable so the next thing we're going to do is actually make a call to this and i will tell you we're going to be in a little bit of a bind and we'll get to why in a minute so what we've done is this of course is our basic writer here our basic writer takes in these strings and all it does is it tosses quotation marks. That means that there are a couple of different things we need to do to really start shoring this up to preventing injection. But we'll get to some of those things in a minute. The first thing we're going to do is let's do a map. So this map is going to be of a given cell line. I should say cell. So each one of these represents a cell. And we're gonna do validation utils. And let's say not and we'll do is empty. So what we're saying is cell if is not empty. So if cell is not empty, then we're going to do whatever the next thing is. If cell is empty, then we do whatever the next thing is. If the cell is not empty, then we need to now find out whether or not that first character matches our given determinants for being a formula. And the naive way would have been to have quite simply done l dot char at zero equals and then we do this this would be the naive way and if it doesn't then of course we would just return l if it does then we would tack on like this. So this would be the naive way of doing it, but it would not work in an example where someone is using a minus, a plus, or an at symbol. And we have to remember that for Microsoft Excel, so for our specific client, if that cell starts with a plus, if it starts with a minus, or if it starts with an at, as well as if it starts with an equal sign, then it can be interpreted as a formula. So we can't do it the naive way which goes back to we need to use that pattern that we created. So let's real quickly use this and we're going to do a matcher on this and we're matching on cell and then we just run a simple find. That's it. And thanks to that, what this is going to wind up doing is now providing that escaping that we really wanted. And life is good for the basic csv writer except for of course it's still vulnerable to csv injection if we escape our double quotes and if we break out of those double quotes 
We're actually going to ignore that for right now because it's not a significant portion of this video. We'll note one important thing here though. Our CSV writer right now, this particular version of it is when we are using open CSV, which is, as we saw last time, a fantastic tool to prevent the kind of CSV injection that we had in this particular version. But open CSV, the way it's written right now, since it is automatically going through and serializing our items, it isn't going to provide the same protection for our Excel clients as we see up here in the aforementioned version. And there are different ways that we can wind up handling this to include putting in special code and all of that other kind of stuff. I'm going to actually leave that as an exercise for the listener, at least for now. All right, so the next thing, of course, that we have to do is we need to build this. This, of course, means we're going to have to re-authenticate and then we'll have to re-inject our payload. Since we didn't make the change to the open CSV side of this that we did to the basic CSV writing side, we're going to be able to demonstrate that this in fact works and that we have those protections for our clients. But we're also going to explain one of the reasons why it's not necessarily a good idea, in fact, it's a bad idea to just blindly put in protections like this. So with our client finished and us now logged in, we will run our malicious payload. And now we're going to go through and we're going to run our export. So we see 9.8, I'm going to put 9.8 in. And we see in fact now that we get this tick here. And we're going to run, just to prove that there's no magic behind this, this and we'll do the same exact thing and we notice here the lack of that single tick in front of it whereas for this one we have the single tick and when we look at the two we'll open both we'll do a side-by-side -side comparison and of course this is our version without the single tick so this is the one that was created by open csv whereas this is the one that was created in our example and we notice again how this single tick now prevents this from operating against our chosen client. But if we had not specifically stated that our clients, the clients that we were going to accept and allow are Excel and similar spreadsheet software, and instead we had been doing this for a client that is like what we have here, so it's text-based, be it Notepad, Notepad++, less VI or what have you, then our mitigation, our addition of that single quote, not only would have been bad, but it would have been erroneous because what we do not fix in this is, of course, the attack that is specific to this client, to a text-based client, and that's where we add in new lines and we start creating or recreating whatever the text happens to be that we're after. So if we go through and we say, okay, I want to create another line after this one. Well, let's say we've got, we'll create several of them. Because we're working in the language we are working in, we're going to go through, let's create our exploit in here, say exploit. Let's create our example in here because now I can just do a find and replace, of course, on the quotation mark and i'm going to replace the quotation mark with this that way it functions inside of json because prior to this json of course is not a big fan of what we had now remember where we are injecting to so we are injecting into this side of it which means we want mm, maybe one more line that just has this data and the rest will be filled in by the system itself. So we create one more line and we'll say six, let's do six like this. We'll have a comma, we'll say 
Excellent. All right, so this one is going to purposefully go after our users. It's going to be number three. We'll send this one. Now, if we do both of our exports, so this is our first one, of course, and we can see our injected text here. And we see that single tick, but that single tick didn't solve the fact that we had CSV injection. This is that same export only from our open CSV export. And you'll notice open CSV beautifully and properly does the escaping of these quotation marks. And that's all well and good that prevents CSV injection, but we, the reader, still don't necessarily see that this is actually all one line. This is all one entry. Whereas if we instead were to have seen it in something like Excel or like Libra Office, we would have known in fact that that was the case. So looking for example at this there, we can look at our two examples and we can see here in Excel, beautifully okay well we see where that injection was we see this is all one and we can tell immediately looking at this what's going on that someone's probably up to no good but if we look at this one of course the injection worked although we're still protected here but in this particular case we find ourselves wondering if the user added in that single tick or not was that single tick from a user or was that single tick from our application? We would actually have no way of knowing. And this is where understanding our clients becomes even more important, especially when we start talking about things like how our servers are modifying data and sanitizing data, cleaning data prior to, and when and where logging is taking place, which goes into another common error and that other common error in this case is going to be tied to log injection. And we're going to show how really quickly the client you use for viewing your logs is going to make a difference. So in this particular case, I've adjusted the code here. You can see down below, it used to be, and by default it is as such, if I am authenticating to our system, it would actually verify that this is a username. And the way it does that is using a regular expression that ensures that it matches what we feel a username should look and smell like. However, for our injection in this particular case, what we're going to do is we're going to make use of the username and the authentication. So I've slightly tweaked this. So instead it just checks to see if the username is empty. We can do log injection in other parts of the application, but I figure since this one requires a user to change it, viewers would be more willing and ready to go through and change what they see to better match what they believe is a proper fix for this. So what we've added in is a single line of code. This line is going to be a line that then gets written to the actual logs. So when we look at the logs, we can see our injected text. So error calling method, OGNL, unable to find a user with the given data username, Bill. Now, looking at these logs, such as they are written right now through this particular client, we would assume that these are other errors. And you might, in fact, assume then that Bill is an invalid username. That's further justified by this line right here. Of course, you could have looked at the timestamps, but we'll ignore those for the moment. This line of text here, these two lines would again lead you to believe that in fact there is no user called bill we know there is but since we have injected in these additional pieces you'd think that someone were doing something really bad here now they are doing something really bad they're mucking with their logs which is important because it must it messes up Forensics activity makes it harder to detect when someone's doing something malicious, makes it harder to prove that your logs haven't been tampered with because quite frankly, they just were tampered with. And it also makes it much harder to aggregate and correlate events. 
within logs. There are a large number of reasons why you have to keep your logs nice and clean. But we can see here, now we have a problem. So the question would be, how do we resolve this? And the real answer is the best thing you could do would be to escape anything or encode anything that may be exploited by an attacker in the client you are using or plan on using. This is a text-based log. So the assumption here would be new lines, maybe slash r slash n. So instead, what we can do is replace slash r slash n with the textual slash r slash n. And now if someone were to try to do something like this kind of injection, we would see where that occurred. If the logs instead are intended to be viewed in some other construct, maybe the logs are in HTML, then obviously we would want to protect against HTML injection. And we would want to protect against similar injections designed to exploit against the client we plan on using to view the data in question. We're going to leave that as an exercise to you, the listener. However, hopefully you understand one of the most dangerous things a development team and a security team can do is go about creating supposed fixes, supposed constructs to prevent attacks against clients when they do not know what the client is or how that client is going to interact with the data. And if they don't understand key concepts about what is considered a keyword or important to that given client. In our examples, we went through and we were showing things like the equal sign. And in this case, we were showing things like the new line because these are logs. But that can be a whole host of different things and it varies from client to client. For example, if our system is intended to show web pages in Edge or Internet Explorer, the cross-site scripting attacks for those two platforms are actually a different set than those of Firefox, which is different than Chrome, which is different than Safari. Because each of those browsers, each of those clients does different things. Firefox historically will close unclose tags, which can open you up to injection. Whereas Edge can do things like ActiveX, as can Internet Explorer, which open you up to their own issues. Excel can allow someone to create commands, which is impossible in LibreOffice. But this extends even further because as we demonstrate here, if you go into your software development activities without properly understanding and determining what clients you are going to protect, there's no way you can protect them at all. We see that in these examples because I, as a user of this client, get nothing from what I see here. This does little to prevent me, the forensics person, me, the system administrator, me, the application administrator, from accidentally glossing over an attack or assuming that these are each individual different exports, whereas a CSV tool would be able to see that and would understand that. This also means that if I just assumed that this were done through something like Notepad or what have you, that I will improperly fail to protect my client against these kinds of attacks. This kind of design failure is one of the most damaging and one of the hardest to get around. That design failure is evident in software all over the world. But to give you a really good example, it also happens to be why the super vulnerable Java application is in fact vulnerable to cross-site scripting, even though it shouldn't be. Even though we are utilizing things that are supposed to prevent that because all I have to do is 
encode my malicious text. And if I encode it and send it along, we see my text come through. And the reason why this occurs is because this system was designed to protect a web-based client or anything that will just grab that data, the description, and then mirror it back. But the issue is, in doing so, it was designed so that it will allow certain tags, such as the AHREF, but it won't allow others. And we made a design decision that we have what's called mixed content and then we have text only content. So title, for example, is text only. The tool that we're using in the super vulnerable Java application actually winds up opening us up to additional vulnerabilities due to how it interacts. We are using a tool from OWASP, a library from OWASP that improperly escapes things like the at symbol. And the reason why they did that is because the at symbol can be malicious in some contexts so they always escape it and since they always escape it we have to do an html decode in order to properly reflect this data back so whomsoever is using the api can go through and merely reflect that data back to the user and in cases where we instead allow mixed content, the user is now vulnerable to cross-site scripting via encoding because we have to decode after we clean, after we parse that text. And that's actually all thanks to OWASP's library and decisions that they made when they decided that it would not be configurable. So when we use the HTML sanitizer, we wind up getting hose. I want to thank you for watching this special edition, and we hope that you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, please feel free to add a comment below this video. Thank you guys for tuning in to this episode. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the Ronio and Duran podcast show. And until the next time, I'm Ronio. I'm Duran. Have a good one. Have fun.